Well, here we are starting another part of the series, Flynn. Yes, sir. And um, I've really been enjoying what we've been touching on so far. Yeah, it's been challenging to me personally. We I had that interview it. with Leighton Flowers just recently. Yep. Yeah, it's been, it was nice to meet him face to face. It was neat to talk with him. And that's right. It was it was fun. It worked out really good. Talked about the foundations of Calvinism. And that's what we're doing right now is talking about the series. Um, the series itself is is explaining a biblical perspective um, against Calvinism. Yeah, why it matters. Why is it important? So yeah. It's hugely important. And whether someone's watching this video for the first time or has been following along with the series, mm-hmm. I pray that we continually share with you that our heart is to show what the scriptures say, not to give you a bunch of men's opinions, but our goal and desire is to point to Christ Amen. and to magnify him and, and for us to just grow naturally um, by his word. Yeah. You could almost say supernaturally. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Amen. Before we jump into that, I, I've missed out a major opportunity. Uh, Flynn, I was thinking about this the other day, me and you show up and we do the easy part. We just push record yeah, and then we just talk, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> but my wife put a ton of work into this place and I just wanted to make sure she would be humiliated that I'm doing this, but <laughs> I just wanted, you know, she's always in the background, but she is definitely a part of once lost. And I am just very grateful for how much mm. work she has put into this studio. Yeah, That's great. I mean, we're literally talking about the paint and the design and everything. Yep. And I'm just really thankful. Well, for and that. even beyond that, I think over the years we've had lots of good conversations. She has a lot to bring to the table. <laughs> literally and figuratively. So yeah. she's been a she, blessing over the is years. Is she available to um, do some work for uh, my ministry? Yeah, <laughs> that's her, right. Put her on the board. and have Hey, her, she she's really brilliant on that. You guys hear that voice. So I want to intro. Uh, we have Micah Coat joining us today. Uh, thank you, Micah, so much for jumping in here. I really appreciate you making the time to join us. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I've known your ministry for some time now, and it's great to finally be here. And I really appreciate you. You guys taking the time to have me on. Yeah, man. Uh, before we get into the reason why you're here, um, I just kind of want to talk about you yourself. Um, as you can see, I'm sporting the swag today. Thank you. Um, Thank but you. that's not that's not me just talking about the swag. Like, I'm not just trying to do that. But me and my wife listen to your podcast. So for those that might get immediately offended because what we're going to talk about today, I want to make sure they're very aware, very aware that there is a ton of other stuff you do. Um, and that is Salvation and Stuff podcast. So tell us a little bit about that before we get into the meet today yeah um well i was in the ministry for 12 years as a youth pastor and i uh, loved it but then i took a break um from vocational ministry but i never wanted to leave doing ministry mm-hmm. and so salvation and stuff is a nonprofit organization and it's a it's pretty much my ministry of, of podcast and blogs um and so that's that's the way that i stayed in ministry without you know, being in a church or, uh, you know, paid by a church. So that's my ministry, salvation and stuff. Yeah, it's a parachurch ministry, like encouraging and growing the church. Yep. Um, The podcast is, uh, it's a biographical, historical, uh, theological. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, all of those things, it's it's made to be evangelical. So I want to encourage people who have been walking with the Lord for 50 years, to someone who doesn't, even, who isn't even a Christian, and say, "How has God moved in history through these certain people's lives? What did they do, and how can we learn from them?" Yeah, not repeat history. Yeah, hopefully. yeah, yeah. And history is filled with all kinds of uh, amazing Christian men and women who have just led a, led amazing lives. And uh, that's right. So my podcast is that, and then I also do a blog on the side, which I write on history and culture and stuff like that. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, point that out because me and my kids, like when we're going for a drive or something, we're like, uh, we really enjoy um, the things that the perspectives that you encourage that goes back to the scripture. Cool. So um, really Thank appreciate you. that. Um, also, um, I, I loved finding this out and that's why we're here today. Mm. You wrote a book. This is a very thick book. Like I enjoy reading. This is an awesome book and it's called A Cultish Side of Calvinism. Yeah. Yep. First of all, tell us a little bit uh, I guess what led you now we're going to get into the title. We're going to get into the heart of it, but, um, that's why you're here today. But, um, what led you to write a book? Um, so I wrote that book years ago. It was published, I think 12 years ago. Okay. But I even wrote most of it before it was published when I was like in my late twenties. Oh, wow. Um, and 
That was because I remember one day just driving down the road listening to um, a Christian broadcast, and that was just part of my life. And I remember early in my faith just a lot of Christian leaders making claims correctly of how evangelical Christian uh, Protestantism, which is what we are, differs from Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, and all these other different Christian faiths. And I got that. Sure, you know, I, I agreed with everything they were saying. But I never heard, I really never heard someone say, but look at Calvinism. I never heard any Christian leader in my small world of, of who I was listening to at the time um, really can really shed light on what Calvinism was teaching. Yeah. And so I thought, man, this is, like I agree, Mormonism preaches a different Jesus as does Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. But then we have these doctrines of Calvinism, which is one of them is limited atonement that God, that Christ only died for a certain amount of people. You're right. Yeah. I'm thinking that is, that is, uh, you know, what's the word? It's just grossly unbiblical and maligns the character of God. And mm -hmm. I couldn't hear anybody speaking out against that. And so um, that was one of the driving factors like, hey, there needs to be more more voices saying kind of what that what that is and so yeah that's kind of the basis of where i started from yeah for the sake of keeping things biblically clear in the midst of an extremely foggy time we wanted to take a minute to clarify that the interviews at once lost ministries do not necessarily imply our complete endorsement of those ministries organizations or their resources the only endorsement that's worthwhile is that which is in alignment with biblical truth we appreciate and are challenged by a variety of believers, however, cannot necessarily vouch for every teaching or resource available from other ministries. Remember, God's word instructs us to trust him alone and not to put our trust in man, Psalm 118.8. His challenge is to be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11, searching the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. That's right. Please check out all other resources, including those here at Once Lost, with an intent to measure everything against God's word. Well, jumping into that, so the the title itself, uh, most would say is is uh, quite controversial. Yeah. Um, the but I think that it was uh, wise in the outtake, and I think you'll be able to explain that in itself, saying that it's cultish. Um, but um, the terminology mm. uh, terminology comes off a little intense for some people coming by. Yeah. Um, you know, why did you ultimately decide to use such a provocative term? Yeah, great question. Um, it is provocative, and uh, I did that intentionally. But where I came from, uh, how I, where I came from as far as writing the book, to me was pretty easy to see. Hey, look at tulip theology. And again, I'm not critiquing, uh, you know, people and persons. There's tons of Calvinists in my life at the time when I wrote that book, and now who are a vital part of my life, and I love, and are godly men and women. So I am critiquing the theology, and namely tulip theology. Yeah. But um, to me, it was very, at a cursory understanding of Calvinism, it was like, this doesn't line up with biblical theology. It, this is systematic theology to, to a default, to a fault. Hmm. Uh, it does not match up with biblical theology. And for me, it was like, that was pretty easy to see. You don't have to be a professor. You don't have to be an ex-Calvinist. It's pretty out in the open. And so I took the... Um, the route of just saying, Hey, I'm kind of building upon that. Like it's pretty common knowledge to see that Calvinism doesn't line up with biblical theology. So therefore I'm just saying, I lay that out in the book, but not only is it unbiblical, but there's certain characteristics of it that are kind of cultish. Yeah. Um, you know, we can get into that, but, um, so that's kind of the next level is like, Hey, not only is it this book, cause there's a couple of really good books out there that lay out what Calvinism is. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of like a, on top of that. Yeah, for sure. Flynn, what are your thoughts on the, the idea of the title itself before we get even further? Well, we were talking a little bit earlier and I, I like it. I, I don't think you're being provocative for sales. You know, I don't mm -hmm. get a sense that you're trying to just shock people, Yeah. Um, but speak the truth. And we're called, Ephesians talks about that. We're called to speak the truth in love. And sometimes there are times the scriptures are, are given for reproof, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And, um, you know, they're there to help us 
know the truth. And sometimes you have to speak not rudely, but, but plainly. Yeah. And there are, I don't disagree. I've gone through, I haven't gotten through the whole book yet, but I've gone through enough to know the, the thrust. And yeah. I, and I, I think it's a great book. It's a, it's a great take on it. Yeah. Um, biblically and just logically. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, personal perspective, uh, there's a really, I, I don't want to like, I'm not publicly endorsing it, but there's a podcast I follow called cultish, which is, uh, uh, Paul of Apologia um, Ministries, which I completely have have run into conversations with uh, Jeff Durbin, and those conversations have happened, which we are totally opposites in those conversations. But that being said, there's a ministry called Cultish, and I find this ironic. That's why I'm giving a context, um, is they specifically always talk about cults, and their perspective on the podcast are always to point out this, the differences and the, the cultish side of things. Mm-hmm. And they were looking for ideas from their listeners of what's the next topic we can talk about. And someone threw on their, their chat, how about Calvinism? And they aren't publicly Calvinists, but they are Calvinists. Mm-hmm. And they were so offended that someone would ask them to evaluate their belief mm-hmm. um, because it is cultish. At least that's what we're, our, we're, we're going to give, um, you know, we're going to lay that down today. But I like what you put in this quote today. I'm going to quote directly from there. It says, although some doctrinal beliefs are trivial, some are so significant that they can put one's eternal future at risk. Concerning Calvinistic doctrine, quote, what is at stake is nothing less than the question of how we are saved from our sins and granted eternal life, a question towards which no believer can rationally be indifferent, end quote. Then it says, in reality, quote, the doctrines of Calvinism, if really believed and consistently practiced, are determ- de- detrimental to evangelism, personal and personal soul winning, prayer, preaching, and practical Christianity in general. Yeah. And then wrapping it up, um, it says, my purpose in writing this book, this is the heart, and I pray that people can get past the title because sometimes it just agitates the flesh. And we just need to put those things aside and be um, willing to talk about these things. It says, my purpose in writing this book is not only to show that Calvinism is unorthodox, but that it is, has a potential of sharing characteristics of a classic Christian cult. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's clear, it's concise, but, um, it, for viewers that may not understand what a cult is, or for those that are Calvinists listening, agitated, ready to just bite on us and get really offended by those terms. Um, please explain to us at least with a overview of why, why a cult? Um, so there's, you know, there's various definitions of what makes up a cult, and everyone has their own definitions, but <clears throat> I think there's a core, um, you know, a core that everyone can agree upon, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be through the leader, um, how uh, they interpret or twist scriptures to, to fit their uh, certain theology. Mm-hmm. Um, so all those things uh, are here. Um, here's one thing. Okay. When a Mormon comes to my door or a Jehovah's Witness comes to my door and we talk and I'll say, you know, um, hey, I'm a believer. I accepted the Lord when I was seven. And then when I was 20, I really just really gave my heart and my life and everything to the Lord when I was 20. I'm a believer. I believe in God's grace through faith. Um, I can I can show you how I believe because I, I was in the ministry for a number of years. I'm, I'm active in my church you know, I can kind of show like, hey, I'm walking with the Lord. Thanks for coming to my door. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with your theology, but I do have a walk and a knowledge with Jesus. They're not happy with that because to them, I have to be a Mormon or have to be a Jehovah's Witness. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? So if that's, that's not true. And that's one sign of being a cult. So if I was to evangelize and I come up to someone, hey, have you heard of Jesus? You know, and they say, man, I've been a pastor for 20 years. I have a church down the street. Um, you know, we're, we're doing well and we believe in God's grace through faith. And we agree on the fundamentals. And it's like, oh man, thanks brother. Like we're, you're in the family. And I could say, God bless you and walk away. Cause I don't need to convert them to my specific, um, my specific theology. Right. You know, like yep. you're a believer and, and that, and so when Mormons do that to me, I get offended or I get upset because it's like, you know, you, you want me to be a Mormon, yeah. not just a Christian. Right. That's not good enough. And so um, when I wrote the book, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, there was a 
really big uprising of Calvinism. And it was pretty much saying, hey, we're glad you're a Christian, but you're not really. Not there yet. You're, right. you know, you're at baby stages. When you become more mature, Mm -hmm. you will adopt uh, a tulip theology. Yeah. And I, you know, I was working at a, um, at a um, hospital for a a chaplain for a little bit. And this little guy there, he was someone I was working with, um, said, you're talking about theology. And he goes, well, obviously you're not an Arminian. Like that was just like, obviously you aren't that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm like, he he was all big on RC Sproul at the time. And just that attitude of like, obviously like, you know who RC Sproul is. And if you Mm -hmm. don't, then you're Mm -hmm. a baby Christian. And I would, you know, got turned off by that and other similar experiences and that attitude of inferiority yeah, uh, or superiority, but inferiority if you're not a Calvinist. So you can kind of say maybe it's a, like a doctrinal or doctrine elitism in a Mm. sense. And I've, I've heard people too often say, you know, it's one thing to talk to somebody about doctrinal differences and you go through the scriptures, that's fine. But there is a pressure to almost evangelize the believers more than the world. A lot of them, right. a lot of times <clears throat> you're just in there and you're like, okay, well, I'm in a church and I'm going to teach everybody the deeper meaning of what I believe now and I'm going to just evangelize them to the right way. And, the, and then there's a part to that, of course, we're called to. We're called to iron sharpening iron. We're called to teach and even the believers to, you know, they had with Priscilla and Aquila and showing them a more excellent way yeah. for Apollos. Um, sometimes we need that more excellent way but when, when I talk to people, and this, this has also happened, I think, when I dealt with people um, who are in the, the, the faith movement, the name it, claim it movements, mm-hmm. um, often it's when you're talking to them, you start talking about scripture and they go, well, hold on, let me get this other book mm-hmm. that I have. And, and we're talking about a book, but we're not, we're not recommending that you read the book in place of the Bible. We're saying these things expose some of these things that are going on. Right. But I remember a, a lady that we talked with and she had a certain view on a certain thing and I said, well, let's talk about it over scripture. And she was like, no, no, you got to read this guy's writing. Yeah. And immediately it was uh, in the writing. And I took a pencil. I said, I'm going to go through the whole thing if you want me to. And I'll, I'll mark wherever I see an error. And it, almost immediately it was, well, the Greek, in the Greek, it doesn't really mean this. Mm. And I was like, well, that's the plain reading. I can look that up and see that in Blue Letter Bible or anywhere. But somehow he had some kind of deeper secret meaning. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it was, it really means this. And, and it gets, it, and that's what you have to do. Like in Jehovah's Witness uh, theology and Mormonism theology, you have to redefine words yeah. mm-hmm. and build from there to create this facade. And, and, I, and I would think in, yeah. Cal, yeah, in Calvinism, Calvinism, you see the same thing, and, and, the pattern. And I just want to say up front, like, I, and if, you read their first couple pages. Some people have asked me after they read the book. So do you think Calvinism is a cult? I say, no, read the first it specifically says, um, you know, I don't believe Calvinism is a cult or mm-hmm. its members are part of a cult. I, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But there are characteristics mm-hmm. that are alarming. Right. I just want to clarify good. that. Yeah. And that's why the title, I mean, it says the cultish side of Calvinism. Right. It doesn't yeah. say the cult of Calvinism. Yeah. And that's why I think it's wise is to like examine yourself, like to, to really question where you're at and where's your, you know, getting that radar, pulling you into Christ. I, I, I have heard testimony after testimony of um, some kid, you know, got super on fire for the Lord, zealous and excited to grow. And then, um, you know, never once thought about Calvinism, never had these ideas ingrained into them. But then they went and met a guy and the guy led them through these things. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it truly is like extra biblical resources, which are good. We glean and grow from extra. I mean, we're talking about a book here. Right. So if we, we would be hypocrites if we said don't read other books. Right. But the, the, the goal is, is like I can question this book. Right. I can question your book, Micah, based on what the scriptures say and see what lines up with it. And I appreciate that. And the moment someone says, well, you just don't understand yet. Like it really irks me sometimes. I, I've been told so many times you're a Calvinist and you just don't know it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I, I'm not. Yeah. Like I, I can't accept that. And it's because I don't have to, I don't have to accept um, these, these points put on me and I only accept what the scripture calls me. And that's um, plain and it's plain reading. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm kind of straightforward. And one thing that really irked me in reading a lot of Calvinist writings and, and uh, um, their defense of their doctrine is it just sounded like a politician. 
Mm. Sound it was just double talk. You're right. And I, I was just like, you can't have it both ways. Like Dave Hunt's book is great. Like, what love is this? Mm-hmm. When I preach, sometimes I preach, or when I do my podcast, I can I can confidently say, God to the stranger I, who I don't know is listening in Nigeria to my podcast. I don't know. God loves you. Has a plan for you. Wants you to repent. And, and become his child, just not his creation, but his, his beloved son. He wants you to come into his family. I believe that, mm-hmm. and I pray for you. And I can't say that if I, if I held to tulip theology. I just can't not say it. Not yeah. consistently. I mean, there are some that do, but it's not consistent, and you have to then st- right. take a step back and say, look, if my theology doesn't line up with the teaching from Scripture, the plain teaching of Scripture and God's character, mm-hmm. then... You have to make a decision. At yeah. some level, you have to make a decision. Which are you going to hold to? Yeah, you're right. And they, they do really avoid, um, and, and again, we're not talking about a specific person. We're talking about in general Calvinists. Um, they, they try not to make it the, the gospel personal, which we see Christ constantly making it personal. You, they, we, like all, the, not we, but, you know, they're constantly putting it directly to the person to repent, uh, yeah. the call for all to come and all meaning all. Um, but to say... Like to actually uh, a consistent, I've met one, I've met one consistent uh, Calvinist that will literally say when I share the gospel, um, I will say Jesus died for sinners like you. He won't say that Jesus died for sinners because um, then they might assume that Jesus died for him. And I'm like, wow, it's Uh, crazy. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I have a chapter in the book that goes over the terminology of Calvinism. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, because they'll say, some people might say, well, yeah, God loves everyone. But he doesn't salvifically love some people. Right. What, right. what is that? Like, yeah. what kind of language is, is that? Like, right. in Dave Hunt's book, you know, what love, what love is that? Right. It's not a love. Uh, you know, just choosing some and, and excluding others um, yeah, right. is not found in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And if it, you know, if it was, like, well, that's not really love, is it? Yeah. Um, so... No, and you can't can't go and say, well, it's just mystery. We don't quite understand why it doesn't reconcile reconcile to the human mind. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's like, okay, but the Bible does have a lot to say on God's love and who he's calling. And it, I mean, John 3, 16, and I know that they'll say, oh, well, world doesn't mean world there. Mm -hmm. But there are so many times consistently through Genesis all the way to Revelation. I mean, the gospel, even in Revelation, the angel proclaims the gospel to the whole world. Mm -hmm. It's not just to certain people at that point. So God's from Genesis to Revelation, his message is to the whole world. I mean, the flood was for the whole world. The condemnation is for the whole world. Mm-hmm. You go through, you know, a lot of times you go through Romans 3, 3.23, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That all means all. Yeah. But why is it the scriptures around right. there if don't we, mean all? If we've all sinned, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, I'm assuming that means every single person right. who's ever lived from Adam to now, we've, we've all sinned. Right, yeah. And Christ died for all. Right. Yeah, and Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, was pretty clear when he went even further into Romans 5. I'm assuming that's where you're going to turn, right? Or maybe you're back into 3. But in 5, he says, by death, uh, all died, yep. speaking of the first Adam. And then it says, by all, that some might be saved. So we see the all uh, explicitly pointing out uh, all, meaning all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, well, yeah, and I was going to go not to just three. all, just not not like certain groups within that, yeah, right? Not, right, right, right. Not, like, not groups, because yeah. yeah. even the world was cursed by sin, right? right. We're not just talking about all, like everything. The universe, affected. yeah. The There'll universe. be a time when God lets go of the entire universe That's and right. creates a new heavens and a new earth. Why? Because sin corrupted all. All. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was just going to read verse twenty-two. Uh, you know, it says even uh, chapter three in Romans, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of G- or in Jesus Christ, unto all. And upon all them that believe, for there is no difference for all have sinned. Yeah. And if you just take all of the Calvinistic doctrines, all meaning all there, take them all out, mm-hmm. take all your preconceived notions that you've heard for years, maybe drilled into you. And here's the thing about how cults work. You know, they're very consistent and inconsistent at the same time. It's like they're very consistent in certain doctrine or methodologies, but then people are going to disagree. You know, Calvinism is not, everyone doesn't agree even within the camps. You're right. What's what, and, you know, but generally speaking, TULIP is at least generally very consistently taught. 
Right. And it has to be. But you have all of that. But if you take all of that aside and you read this, well, it's, the plain reading is all, all who put their faith in Christ mm-hmm. will be saved. Why? Because all have sinned. Mm-hmm. So the all is for all. Yeah. And to all who want to believe. You're right. So ultimately, you can't play games with the scriptures. Yeah. You know, and I think that's where the cult side does come in. And, you know, when you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, one of the first things when you talk about Jesus, if they take you there, John 1, in the beginning was the word. The, the word, word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. A God. And you right. go, uh, wait, now what? And I remember yeah, being a, nice a young insertion. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, because the original had it wrong. We just yeah. have to give you a deeper meaning. It's like, wait, when you change that, man, that changes the entire character and nature of Jesus, the entire character yeah. and nature of God. And it's interesting how every false doctrine ultimately leads to the character of Christ. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I think it's such a big deal. You know, I've taken a back seat for the last 10 years. I've kind of like wrote my book and just kind of laid back and haven't been involved. But yeah, it, it really does... Um, uh, Tulip theology changes soteriology, Christology, pneumatology, Mission, anthropology. Yeah. It changes everything, and so what you know, you really do have this. Um, it just changes everything. Yeah, and that's because of the portrayal of Christ at the end. Of it, like we really should evaluate everything based on how Christ lived and did things, and and he is the example. Like we literally can see how he ministered to all people. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it wasn't a certain few. And there's almost an elitism there. And I think that's also a cultish side. I don't know if uh, if you've thought about that, but like the idea to know, I, I, it's almost like that saying. Like I think it was Moody that said it. Deal Moody. He said, um, you know, we're all the same. The only difference between us and a sinner, like someone that hasn't believed yet, is as we're all hungry, we're all beggars, but we know where the bread is. Right. But for the Calvinist says, I know where the bread is, and you're not allowed to have any bread. And that gets really dangerous. And that is that is the dangerous cultish side is saying, look, man, you're literally saying you have access to something that no one else, like these very specific people were predestined to not have access to bread. They cannot feed on the bread of life. They cannot drink of the everlasting water. They have zero access. Even if they want to come, well, they would never want to. Well, what if they do want to? Like we talked about that yeah. previously about how Calvin said someone could be so close but yet, uh, but miss it, right? Right. And that's 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 the definitely the cult yeah. side. Well, and there is an elitism, but often a Calvinist would very. Cl- I mean, I've been told that I don't believe that I'm better than anybody just because I'm elect. I know I'm a sinner, and I think that's very sincere when someone says that. I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm saved by grace. I don't think I deserve it. Right. But to say that I'm chosen, no matter how you. And some aren't. Yeah, you know what I mean. At some level, there is pride in there, whether yeah. you see it or not. The doctrine appeals yeah. to the intellect. You're it right. appeals. Yeah. That's why there's so many people that love the philosophy of Calvinism. Mm-hmm. And in Dave Hunt's book, he examined Calvin pretty pretty closely, mm-hmm. and had an interesting uh, premise in there that Calvin, you know, when he wrote those the the, the or his you know institutes, mm-hmm. he was not necessarily a very mature believer at best. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're younger in the Lord, if he was in the Lord at the time, uh, you know, there tends to be a bit of pride that can be in that writing. And uh, there is pride in there. Yeah. Whether you want to admit it or not, I know some will just not agree with that at all. But Yeah, Leighton Flowers, I listened to Leighton Flowers a little bit about a month ago, but he delved into that, which which you have two situations, um, which you just laid out acknowledging you're a sinner saved by God's grace. And you know, like, we don't have pride on that. Like there's nothing that I have pride in myself of or someone who says, who acknowledges they're a sinner, but God chose me. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. It's like, yeah. which one would lead to more pride? Yep. You're right. Um, and then that can be twisted in. Well, you, all the power lies with man and not God. So therefore it's right. a man exalting, you know, our, our Anything non-Calvinistic is a man exalting theology, which is just not true garbage. Yeah. yeah. Well, for the sake of time, uh, I, I, there's a tons of things I would love to pick your brain, and I'd be happy to. to I know Flynn for sure. We would uh, be happy to have you on another time and mm-hmm. do some more talk. Definitely. Um, r- you wrote the book, you know, in 2011. So, 
have you seen changes? Have you seen, um, you know, kind of like a shift or like difference in the, the time you've wrote this book and where we're at today, 2023, you know? To be honest, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it was, like I said, I've kind of taken a back seat. I've been working in construction for the last nine years now. Yeah. Um, uh, I was, you know, so I, I haven't, when I wrote the book, well, when the book was published, there was a lot of, um, mm-hmm. a lot of growth in Calvinistic churches. Um, and it was kind of all over. I don't know if that settled down or not. I don't think it has. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I don't really have firsthand knowledge. I'm mm-hmm. not into it You're right. as much as I used to be. Uh, yep. Let me piggyback off that then. What um, What is the appeal then? You know, we're talking about pride. We're talking about years later after you wrote this. But, you know, whether it grew or not, like, Flynn, we were talking recently about the waves of Calvinism. You mm-hmm. kind of see a shift. But, like, what is the appeal? Yeah. You know, uh, this was something me and you were talking about as well another time. Yeah. I wish I would have spent more time in uh, the book about why, what is the draw towards Calvinism? Mm -hmm. Because there's a huge draw and it's, and it was um, with mostly young people. Um, And I wish I spent more time on that. I don't really know that I have, I have ideas, you know, um, one, one thing, you know, they call it reformed faith, you know, the restless reformed. Yeah. And so (laughs) reformed is like, yeah, like I'm reformed. Uh, We kind of, because it, what that's talking about is is Protestantism. It's Martin Luther's, you know, five solos. It's through Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, to the Scripture alone, mm-hmm. to the glory of God alone. Mm-hmm. Like we can all say, man, we can all say Amen to that, right? That's Protestantism. That's not Catholic. That's in, I think, and I don't know what the deal is, but I think a lot of young Calvinists read that and they're like, "That's Reformed theology." No, that's not Reformed theology. Yeah, they, they don't. They don't get to hijack a movement that Calvin was barely even born when right. things were he started. Was, he was and on the moving. tail end of it, and you yeah. know, he was obviously a Protestant, but he built upon that. But those five solas, which are like, "Man, Amen." Right. That's what we need more of in every single church. Right. Yeah. Grace alone, faith alone, Jesus alone, Scripture alone, right. to the glory of God alone. Right. Hundred percent get behind that i think a lot of young younger that appeals to a lot of younger christians as it should because right. that's good but yeah. that's not calvinism it has nothing to do with the calvinistic faith that's yeah. protestantism i think it's almost like you you picture like a, a hotel wanting to get business and so they go on that one road that everybody has to travel and there's no stretch or no spot to stop and so they they see that there's a nice hotel there that people can stop and they set up a sign ahead of that hotel with their mm-hmm. sign leading people almost to, right. you know, to a different place and it does lead to a different place. And I wonder sometimes if some of the, some of the um, emergent church movement, if some of the um, sort of the, the seeker sensitive yeah. and that kind of stuff, the Bill Hybels and the Rick Warren right. move, let's just be contemporary and, you know, just make it about us and, yeah. I think there were a lot of people getting saved and they were like, this is not, I'm not interested in this at all. And I think they were excited. And then they got, I really think people's teachings like MacArthur or Sproul just registered, um, you know, Alistair Begg. And it sounded like these people are at least preaching with conviction and they're preaching the word. And it, yeah, I think that hooked a, them. I think that has, has a huge, it's definitely captivating. Spot on yeah. on and, and I remember, I remember as a baby Christian, you know, I was about 20, 22 years old and out in the garage working on my car and other things, listening, you know, back then it was before a lot of cell phone stuff, but listening to the radio and listening to Alistair Begg and just enjoying the, yep. the teaching mm-hmm. and not realizing what was really going on. But then after realizing, oh, there's this thing called Calvinism and oh, there's like a difference then you start spotting it. Yep. But until then, you just kind of, it's sort of like hook, line, and sinker until you don't realize, oh, like you've been redefined on these ideas. And for me, it was starting with that idea of dead. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm de- I was dead in my sins and trespasses. I was a sinner, rotten, you know, to the core. Mm-hmm. So they go, uh-huh, see? And then they t- start from there, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit different uh, message or in yep, a different right. interview. But And I think, I think yeah. and a part with that is, you know, there's a part of it, a part of Calvinism that says we handle the hard doctrines of God that mm-hmm. no one wants to hear. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely parts of, you know, biblical theology that are difficult. They're hard to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they, uh, 
a lot of Calvinists capitalize on that. Yeah. Well, if God says that, you know, he works uh, sovereignly, you know, then he we're just going to preach that and yeah. you can, de- and all the, everyone else, it doesn't matter what they think. It's just like hardcore God's word. And that's all good to an extent, mm-hmm. except when it gets to umbilical things, you know? Yeah, that's right. Um, so like the, the Bible does talk about elect. There's an elect of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do I reconcile that? Well, you know, there's been a lot of uh, um, attempts to reconcile those two things. Mm-hmm. For me, I think I see two truths in the Bible. I see free will and God's elect. Mm. And there's, like I said, a lot of ways you can look at that. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I purposely kind of stayed away from that. No, I don't understand that. I'm just saying what the Bible does say. Mm-hmm. And so my contention with Calvinism is that Calvinism says we've solved that mystery and we've taken away the free will of man. Yeah. And, and I think all five points of tulip can all each one individually be, be boiled down to the uh, denial of man's free will. So I'm, I was actually thinking of writing some more and just writing a book on the free will of free will of man, mm-hmm. including total depravity and what all that means. Mm. But all the points boil down to the denial of man's free will. Yep. And that's how they solve that mystery. Well, yeah. in, in Scripture, God, I mean, in First John, but all throughout Scripture, if you're going to define God, God is love. And when you, we were talking about this before, Satanism is ultimately is a, is a religion of love. But the problem is the, the characteristics behind that love, the direction of that love. And mm-hmm. for the Christian, God is love, meaning his character is love. He's also truth. He's also integrity. He's also holy. We know that. But right. in Scripture, they're very carefully, God is love. Mm-hmm. Um, for Satanism, it's love, but it's self-love. So there is an attack on the character of God in a sense. Doctrinally, it's a mm-hmm. different love. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think you know they chose that title for Hunt's book. But it sums it up really, really s- simply to me. And uh, the, the answer of elect is, is like anything else in Scripture— you answer it with other scriptures. So if man does have free will, then and then you are part of the elect of God, then the, the question would be, elect to what? Mm-hmm. And I was talking about this earlier when I was sharing um, about the gospel uh, at the little church I was sharing at. God's pre-des- pre-design, his predestination idea, you can easily say it's for, um, you know, the purpose of God's salvation is predestined. And the plan of salvation is predestined, but you cannot say, and this is where Calvinism would launch off into, the people are predestined. Mm-hmm. So his purpose is clear. He has His purpose is so that we'll glorify him, so that we'll magnify him, bear fruit, you know, grow in him, be his child. All of those things are the purposes. That would be what the elect, you know, when you're born again, you become the elect of God. That's all part of the purpose. That's right. When you adopted the girls, you know, there was a pattern, there was a plan. Mm-hmm. But they had to choose at some level, even being, mm. you know, underage. They had to say, yes, I really want this too. Yeah. So you could say, yeah, the, the adoption was predestined mm-hmm. because the purpose was there. The plan was there, but ultimately not the people. Yeah. That would be illegal. Yeah. So in, a, in most, right. you know, most, uh, most at least cases. decent uh, countries. So um, and why would we say any less? Why would, why would God's gospel be any less than that? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and I just want to take it back to why is, uh, you know, is it appealing? And, um, yeah. and when I wrote the book, I found a number of older believers who were like, I have no idea. Like, so there was this Bible translator. He's not a dummy. He spent his whole life translating the Hebrew text into a uh, native uh, American language. Mm. Him and his wife, uh, great, great people. Uh, so they're academic they're, you know, they've learned the languages. They're into theology. Mm-hmm. He was, I think, born and mostly raised in a pre, in a Presbyterian faith. So, um, yeah. you know, that's kind of the back. The background is Calvinism. Then, mm-hmm. but he just like, okay, whatever. I'm into my ministry, and he he lived on the reservation for probably fifty years. Um, <clears throat> but he read my book at he when he was probably eighty five. Mm. 90 and he's Mm. still serving like, you know, and he was like, I, I really had no idea what Calvinism was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is not a, you know, like I said, he's a, he's a smart guy, been in ministry his whole life, but just never 
really considered what the tulip theology was. And right. so that was encouraging me like, wow, there's some people who have been in, kind of in this background, um, but really don't have a clue what it is Yeah, that we don't see that in the younger population. Cause they're, they're learning from the get go. Like yep. this is what tulip theology is. And they're using a lot of resources. Um, I know for early on, I would find a good DVD that was examining like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, examining like, I think it was called indoctrination or something. And it was taking, yep. uh, taking apart the issues with the public school system. And I love that DVD. I recommended yeah, I it to parents and everybody else that I was, cause I'm a teacher, you know, and I thought, well, good. I want, I want people to know like the issues with this history, but then it's tied in so much with Calvinistic authors and people yep. who, but it doesn't say anything about Calvinism in the DVD, but you watch a good research DV documentary DVD biblically. And then you go, Oh, well, yeah, this is really good. This is like, this is meaty stuff. Yeah. Oh, but l- let me see who the authors are. Oh, let me see what books they write. And I, and with right. it, I did it just for fun. I took one of the authors or writers of it within three clicks. I'm onto Calvinism mm-hmm. right into the, right into the meat of RC Sproul within about three clicks of taking their name searching it out and then click, click, click. Yeah. And there I am. Yeah. And so it doesn't take long and producing good resources is great. Uh, and we've recommended, I'm sure a few things on this site that we're not a hundred percent like, yes, believe everything that person has written. Cause we're all called to really take it to the scriptures ourselves. That's right. But we try to be careful and make that clear when that happens. Yeah. Um, but I think that too has been a thing where people want that meat. The yep. problem is they're getting steered in a different direction. Yeah. And I think, uh, kind of going a different direction, but kind of highlighting it all is um, something that I've evaluated is there's a lot of teachers out there and pastors, evangelists that, like you said, it's a, it's a, sometimes they get to a, a hard saying in the scriptures and either say it's a mystery, we just can't know it, or they try and answer it without saying, I, I haven't fully understood this yet. And you'll see a lot mm. of pastors from the pulpit just say, well, the word says that God created mischief or he created evil. And they'll just say, well, it's it. So God must be evil. Like he, he does evil and he does good instead of actually trying to research it and work through these things. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. a real laziness from the pulpit that I think happens a lot today. And so then all these people go, well, I don't know what to do with that. And then mm-hmm. they find these very, and I don't mean to say charismatic in the sense of, cause you won't find most Calvinists charismatic, but they're <laughs> very, um, you know, uh, manly men and firm in how they say things. And they sound very sophisticated. I remember the first few sermons. I, I, I remember first coming to the Lord and then like someone saying, Hey, you ever heard of Paul Washer? And I just fell right into it, man. Until I remember hearing one specific thing where a guy came up to him while he was sitting having lunch. And this was a totally random captured video on YouTube. And, uh, the kid came up to him and said, how do you explain to me deadness? How do you explain like explain to me regeneration. He, he goes, well, the best way I can explain it. And this is Paul Washer saying this is um, it's like Lord of the Rings. You, you guys have seen Lord of the Rings and, and uh, it's the orc laying in a tree dead, you know, and they come along and dig the tree out and the orcs come born out of that. And that's the example of Christians. And I'm like, well, what, wait, what? <laughs> I just that's watched his that like best? two nights ago, that exact same scene. <laughs> oh, and that's, you can picture it. Yeah, and so funny. he's explaining this, this kid and this kid's like, oh, wow, here is this really wise, smart, sophisticated preacher and he he says things and man I agree with a lot that that Paul Washer says he says some some great things about repentance and growth and and loving the wife and so much stuff but then he answers this this question to this young kid about Lord of the Rings and an orc coming out of a tree and it's like look guys like we <laughs> this is what we're talking about like this is why we're trying to challenge it um because it it's yeah. It's, it's often uh, intellectual, philosophical, um, psychological, maybe a little. I don't know. But, um, yeah, just questioning all those things yeah. is good. So going further on to that, just like uh, for the sake of time, wrapping it up, yep. are there any other things you think um, that are untalked about? You know, we've talked about a lot of stuff, and people are kind of chewing both sides, ready to comment on this video and have lots of opinions, but – Are there any things that, you know, there's a lot of videos back and forth. We talked about Leighton Flowers. Uh, There's a lot of resources out there pro and against Calvinism. Yep. Um, What are some things that you don't think are are often talked about or a thing? Um, Well, I don't know if I'm answering your your question directly, but um, Mm -hmm. someone from looking at the title of the book, oh, that's, that's really bold and uncalled for. Mm-hmm. 
um, could think, well, Micah is a, uh, you know, he's just, it's this way or, or the highway, super rigid, no grace. Um, and I, I would hope, I've heard some comments back that when they read the book, they were surprised by how graceful it was given the title. Um, but for me, it's a big deal because, you know, I, I do consider tulip theology to be heretical. That's another strong word, but I think there's, I have personally tons of grace for like, for, like me and you do not agree on a, probably a lot of things mm-hmm. and it's just differences of opinion um, and we can talk through those things and work through those things. Um, but it's, but we agree wholeheartedly with the foundations of Christianity. Mm. And I think that should bind us together. Um, that we agree on these, on these, uh, really important things. Um, yeah. so yeah, in the book, you know, I think it's a really big deal to, to believe in limited atonement or to, to believe in, uh, I believe in total depravity, but not that regeneration happens before, mm-hmm. you know, you're saved. Like there's no free will in that. Like those are really big things um, that I think we should talk about. But I just wanted to clarify that, like the difference between uh, what I consider just heresy, mm-hmm. which is, which I mean, those doctrines that affect soteriology, how we're saved, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, who God is, what man is like, those are important things as opposed to uh, what you might consider a false doctrine and I might just consider a false teaching right. regarding uh, women in church or having their heads covered, uh, men's having, men having their heads covered. There's opinion on that, and the Bible speaks to sure. that. And I think there's, um, you know, but there's interpretational differences mm-hmm. that we could be like, yeah, at the end of the day, we're still, we're still um, solid on the foundations. Yeah. Well, there's a difference, I think, between the operation of certain certain order of things versus doctrinal issues that have to do, like you're saying, if it's dealing with salvation, if it's dealing with the character of Christ or at any level, in my opinion, an attack on the gospel. Mm -hmm. Paul was very clear. I mean, he corrected Peter to his face, right? Mm -hmm. Because it affected the gospel. And again, I went back to that this morning and you look at there's the, we get our light from the gospel. We get our truth from the gospel. We get our life from the gospel. We get our love from the gospel. We get our justice from the gospel. Mm -hmm. And Calvinism is a different gospel. People don't get to choose. They are chosen for, they are given the grace to believe. Mm -hmm. Whereas the gospel is clearly throughout scripture consistently, you are called to believe the gospel, mm. not be regenerated by some mystery, and then you can't help but believe through right. some irresistible grace. That's mm-hmm. a that really is a different gospel. Yeah, and I think that's that's a conversation that I'd love to to bring to the table another time, Flynn. Mm-hmm. I think that we could make um, some really good conversation there, where we address the difference between a false teaching and I know we've talked about this in mm-hmm. the past. Mm-hmm. Any false teacher. Because a lot of people immediately get really um, upset when you say this is wrong. But we see Paul, like you said, um, address Peter, mm-hmm. but never say you're not a believer at right. that point. You right. know, he said, look, you're, you're going the wrong way. Yeah, heresy versus a heretic. Right. I think is kind of where you can kind of go on some of these things. And there's yeah. probably a mix. When you're dealing with Calvinism, sure. there's some very genuine people that were saved and probably, for lack of a better term, converted to an ideology, but deep in their heart, know that Jesus is their Lord and Savior yeah. and that they're saved by grace through faith. Yeah. They you know, they don't understand maybe the 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 depth of what they're saying to other people. The challenge is often when you believe a false doctrine, mm-hmm. it doesn't maybe affect you all the time right away, but that next generation, the people that you're teaching it to or sharing it with, then it becomes an issue of not it goes from a false doctrine to really a false almost a heresy to right. the point of where it can lead people to a completely different God. Yeah. If people have their different, there's different definitions for heresy. Mm-hmm. I've kind of made up my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so some people was like, well, you're calling it a heresy. Well, let me, you know, Let's so there's it. room for clarification on, on what that is. Yeah. And I think engaging in the conversation, the, the, the cultish side says, I don't want to talk about it. This is it. Mm-hmm. This is, this is it. And we cannot discuss this. Right. And I think that's where, um, 
where I'd like to push back. And I hope that people, if you agree with me, like we should be engaging in these conversations. And it's a little odd when you say, I won't even address this conversation mm, you right. know, because this is it. Um, I am certainly um, happy every time I say something out loud and my wife goes, ah, you probably said that wrong. And I go, thanks, honey. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm sure my wife's branded me a heretic several times. She's laughing right now thinking about that. But working through these things and just, you know, we talked about this on another episode where we talked about as uh, Psalm 118.8, it's better to put your trust in the Lord than it is in man. And mm-hmm. that includes yourself. That includes your feelings, your emotions, and what some yeah. person, like I, I, I think it's perfectly um, appropriate to say I challenge everyone that I work with and they do the same with me. And we work through these conversations, whether pastor, best friend, a wife, like we just, we take everything to scripture that leads us to Christ mm-hmm. because that's what we want to do is yeah. know God and make him known yep. and not our ideologies. Yeah. Uh, John Machen, Grisham Machen, he was a Calvinist. As far as I know, he was, you know, he went to Westminster. He started Westminster, you know. But I cannot agree with him more on his uh, criticism of liberal theology and modernism. Mm. I read his book so many times, the small book, uh, Christianity and Liberalism. It, it's written 100 years ago, and it's like for today. Like, he was spot on. Mm-hmm. Wow. So there's so much good that, uh, you know, yeah. that um, anyone can bring out. Yeah, I would still, if he was in this room and he said, yes, I believe in tulip theology, then I'd be like, let's go, let's, let's talk about it. But <laughs> well, I mean, he, he was spot on. So there's so many like John mm-hmm. Piper, man, there's so many good people out there um, who consider themselves themselves Calvinists who are offering uh, just, you know, a lot of sound quality, good advice, biblical advice, but, but they're wrong on that. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yep. Yeah. And I think the <clears throat> one thing I want to do and I've been hearing more and more about it for me personally. So I think it's the Lord just challenging me yeah. to be as consistent in every area, whether it's my walk, my talk, my thinking, my heart. Mm. We're called to love the Lord with all of our heart, but also our soul and our mind. And Calvinism is, I think, an appeal to the mind. It's an appeal to the intellect. Mm. And by appealing to the intellect, sometimes it's easy to, to once you're there, to use other intellectual things and other philosophies philosophical things to rearrange a few things and you don't realize it. So an appeal to the intellect is great, but we need to love the Lord with all of our mind, not just simply man's ideas about the Lord. That's right. And there's a huge difference. I mean, a lot of churches are founded on people who love the idea of church and love the idea of particular things that they were doing, but it wasn't the Lord, it was the church. Mm -hmm. And so you have churches that are edifices to man and they might even do some things that are good. But it, if they're not leading people to Jesus, ultimately the true Jesus of Scripture, then it's filthy rags. That's right. And I want, I want to be consistent. And so I think when you talk about people like MacArthur, and you hear these in one, in one breath, they're saying one thing, you know, that people can believe and we have to reach people for, you know, reach the lost. And then you kind of wonder, well, Calvinistically speaking, why? Why do I have to if it's all predetermined? So there's this, this level of let's just get consistent. And being willing to expose those things is okay. Being willing to say, well, let's let's look at where the error is. And if I have inconsistencies according to Scripture, I expect people to say, hey, let's look at that inconsistency. Like, why are yeah. you doing what you're doing, and why do you believe what you believe? Mm-hmm. And that's why we're doing this, yeah. you know, is to challenge all of us yep. to just have Amen. a more consistent walk with the Lord. Amen. And that's our encouragement for all the listeners. Uh, whatever belief or stance you're on, I pray that you— um, you know, you reason through the scriptures like uh, God calls us to, to come and let us reason. And that's that's the encouragement here. I hope that everyone hears our heart um, on the matter because um, we really just, we, you know, we want to, we want to challenge um, the unbeliever and the believer to think and think critically and examine the times and see things and just take these things to God and, and grow, you know, like mm-hmm. it's our encouragement to grow. So mm-hmm. Micah, thank you so much for, for taking the time. I do really appreciate it. Yeah. And um, for everyone listening, uh, make sure and go check out Salvation and Stuff on um, Apple, Spotify. You've got all yep. the podcast mm-hmm. stations out there, right? But also you have a website as well. Yeah, the website is salvationstuffblog.com. Salvationstuffblog.com. <clears throat> and he releases articles as well, has some guest speakers as well. 
And um, just, uh, yeah, definitely go check that out. Check out Once Lost Ministries if you haven't already. If you're new to the video, um, like and subscribe. And just make sure and um, think critically. We're not trying to tell you to like it just because uh, we want you to like it. We want you to share it so that other people, because this is a growing wave. Amen. Is, it is a growing wave, and we want people to think critically yep. and have all the information. Yep. Is that right? Amen. Flynn, Amen. you got anything else to end with? Just stand on the word. The that's B-I-B-L-E, it. yes, that's the book for me, and we'll stand alone on the word of God. That's the book for me. Yep. Amen. All right. Thanks, you guys. We'll see you on the next one.